Good afternoon and welcome to our session, uh, Funding and Implementing a One-to-One -one Mobile Learning Initiative. And we have a short video to introduce our first speaker. Daryl Adams is the superintendent of, of the uh, Coachella uh, Valley Unified School District in California. Uh, where is he? There you go. Good to see you. One of the poorest school districts in the country. And uh, a few years ago, Coachella uh, started providing every student from pre-K to high school with a tablet of their own. Is that one of them that you, yeah? <laughs> you didn't take that from a student, did you? <laughs> okay. Uh, they, they, they paid for it through a bond measure, which voters overwhelmingly approved. So the whole community is committed to their children's education. Many students still don't have internet access at home, but the, the district found a solution for that too. They're putting Wi-Fi routers on school buses and parking them across the district every night. This is really smart, right? So you got to underutilize resources, uh, buses at, in the evening, you put the routers on, disperse them, and suddenly everybody's connected. Now it's not just students who can get online, it's their families as well. So I, I know a lot of superintendents have stories like these. You've found innovative ways to reach your students and improve your schools. There could be no greater introduction than that, Dr. Daryl Adams, superintendent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, President Obama. <laughs> We're just excited to uh, be here with you today and to be at Q 2015. A great opportunity to share um, knowledge, information, and all of our uh, desire to educate the students in America for the 21st century. Uh, we're very, very fortunate to be a part of the President's Connected to the Future um, event that he had back in November. And um, the President asked us to uh, come forward, the top 100 innovative superintendents, and all of, all of our superintendents are working very hard and innovative, but we were lucky enough to be selected. And then, of course, we were even more lucky that he talked about what we were doing in Coachella. So we're happy to be here today to share our story with you and our journey uh, to truly transform our school district into a 21st century teaching and learning environment. And it's been truly a, a labor of love and uh, opportunity for all of our students. So uh, the best way to tell our story, though, uh, is with a video th that was created when we started back in 20. 12, and, uh, and then we'll take it up from there. As superintendent of the Coachella Valley Unified School District, I am honored to serve some of the poorest of the poor in our nation. 97% of our students are Hispanic, and 90% receive free and reduced lunch. And of the small number of students that pursue college, only 16% graduate. Surely, something needed to change. And that change is taking place. We are transforming our district to a one-to-one, 24-7 mobile learning environment. Using Apple technologies, products, and services, our goal, prepare all students for college, career, and citizenship by providing 18,000 iPads for 18,000 students. In April, we traveled to Cupertino. Immediately, we knew that Apple possessed the right approach, the right products, and the right services. In May, we held Transformation Day to chart our path forward. In July, we qualified Measure X, a general obligation bond. In August, we began an ambitious iPad pilot program by placing 5,600 iPads in the hands of our students, with 120 teachers using iPads and Mac Look pros like pros. By utilizing Apple technologies and applications like Keynote, Pages, iMovie, and GarageBand, our data indicated that the pilot program students were more engaged and more excited than ever about their learning. And most importantly, these students are doing better academically and socially. So we are happy to announce that in November, our voters passed Measure X with 67% of the vote. Therefore, our journey continues with Apple products and services at the core of the Common Core. And now, a new and true 21st century teaching and learning environment is possible because we now understand the need to marry technology, content, and pedagogy to ensure that learning is the focus, not memory. Together, we are now paving the way by utilizing iPads and challenge-based learning to transform the way we communicate, create, think, and collaborate. Some say think outside the box. We say there is no box. The question was, what kind of world do you want? The answer is a world where hope plus equity plus Apple leads to a better day and a better way. That video was created 
two, uh, about three years ago, and I actually uh, am the creator of the, uh, I am the creator of the video. I wrote the music, I wrote the soundtrack, I wrote the voiceover, and I did all the editing for the, for the, um, for the footage. And it was all done with uh, Apple products, with MacBook Pro, uh, Final Cut Pro, uh, Logic Pro 10. And uh, the reason I wanted to do that was to show our staff, our students, our community, that if I can do it, you can do it. Technology can truly change the way you uh, learn and the way you grow. So um, those students in the video, it truly has changed uh, their lives, and we call it, you know, the digital divide. How do we uh, navigate that, eliminate that, and leave no child offline? So joining me today in my presentation, Michelle Murphy, who is our Executive Director of Technology Services, and now our Chief Technology Officer. Let's give her a round of applause. We have uh, Israel Alaveras, who's our uh, Mobile Technology, I mean, I'm sorry, our uh, Technology Coordinator. And Eddie Semino, who, uh, who is our mobile uh, coordinator of technology. That's uh, Eddie over there filming for us. Thank you. So we're all going to be sharing um, you know, our journey, uh, give you more specifics on it. But I start with the reason why we began in the first place. When I came to the district four and a half years ago, one of the data points that stood out to me was the fact that of the number of students who graduated at the time, about 70 percent, not a good number, um, of that 70%, maybe half went on to college, not a good number. But most importantly, and most alarming for me was that the ones that did go to college, only 16.5% graduated from college. So to me, that says we had a lot of work to do. We we're not meeting the needs of our students. Because our overall goal is, it, uh, is to ensure that students are prepared for college, career, and citizenship after they leave us. It's more than just a high school diploma. Do they have options when they leave us? And so we went and uh, went out into the community and talked about that data point and the others that affected our decision to move forward and transform our system. The community was number one for us, getting the parents to understand the importance of us transforming this, the school district. We talked about the support that would be needed to, um, to raise the funds to do this uh, iPad initiative. We talked about infrastructure and most importantly, you've seen and know about technology and the importance of uh, integrating that with the content and also with the pedagogy training our teachers. So we decided to go mobile because we wanted students to be able to have access. And uh, we know in order for them to sort of nav navigate the seven C's, uh, they would have to have uh, the ability to uh, access information 24-7. And to us, uh, a desktop or even a laptop was not mobile enough because we knew our parents uh, work. We knew our students are, you know, going from place to place, grandma's house, practice, soccer fields, wherever, and we wanted to provide them with a mobile device that would allow them to be able to teach, learn, grow, communicate, collaborate with their peers, with their teachers at any time, 24-7. We chose Apple uh, iPads because as we looked at the different devices out there, and we have uh, no prejudices against the others, except that Apple was much, much uh, better for us in meeting our needs. It was the ease of use to, to using uh, Apple products. It was very intuitive. You know, our students could basically turn it on and they're off and running. Uh, we love the fact that Apple's e ecosystem amongst their products worked together seamlessly. And of course, uh, the brand name was important to us because if I had gone to my community and said, hey, here's a Kindle, it's cheaper or some other device, they probably would have said, you know, uh, thank you, but no thank you. So we wanted to give them the best product that was available and that the students would be able to get uh, extended uh, life and use out of it. And I'll explain about the extended life in a minute. Uh, you know, the perception was important, though, because if we're going to go to the taxpayers and ask them to tax themselves, I wanted to have the best device that would get uh, the more life out of it and the most use. So. That was one of the reasons we decided to move forward. Uh, our students, we wanted to make sure that they understood the importance of uh, using technology to help them think, critically think, to be creative, to be collaborative, to be, to be able to communicate with their teachers, their classmates. So it was an opportunity for us to, uh, when we did the pilot, was for students to actually start using those devices and to go home and talk to mom and dad about it. And that is exactly what they did. And um, here's a student, Joseph who is one of our original um, Apple geniuses, as we call them, little geniuses. And he's going to talk about his experience and what he's learned 
using these devices. Hi, I am Joseph. I'm a sewing girder at Kawea Desert Academy and an, I'm an Apple genius. At Kawea Desert Academy in California, there's something special going on in Mr. Richardson's class. Mr. Richardson is a wonderful music teacher, but he is also something else. He is our Apple genius teacher. You see, Mr. Richardson has a lot of experience with computers. He uses GarageBand with his students to create original composition. And this year, he has created an Apple Genius class where students have access to iPads and iMacs. We're not only creating projects such as Scientific Method and Spaceship Endeavor, we're also learning how to help other people with technology, including other students and even the teachers at our school. The teacher is sometimes the learner. The learner is sometimes the teacher. Mr. Richardson encourages this idea. Sometimes he'll ask us to find the answer to a question and then explain it to him. For instance, once we were using educations and Mr. Richardson didn't know how to change the color of the text and he told us to find out and then tell him and we did. We like being the Apple geniuses on campus. We like using technology to tell our stories. And we like our teacher, Mr. Richardson, who gives us the opportunity to explore the world as his collaborators. Using an iPhone and a MacBook Pro. No. So we talked, uh, the other thing, the other reason we want to do the pilot, we wanted teachers to start using these devices so they can uh, sort of experience the ease of use. Um, and I sold them on the idea, this is going to make you more effective and efficient in the classroom. And so we did a pilot, which was, you know, 5,600 kids, 120 teachers, and every teacher who wanted to be in that pilot had to apply for it. And there was an extensive uh, process, and I think we have some of our pilot teachers here. Rebecca, were you a pilot teacher? Yes. Uh, you know, Patrick, you were one. Uh, was Eddie one? Yes, Eddie was one. So it was an extensive process to be selected for that because we knew that those teachers would be the cheerleaders for the effort, and they were very comfortable with being a facilitator and a guy by the side as opposed to just a sage on the stage. Um, we utilized TPAC because we knew that in order to uh, integrate every, all of these elements together, we had to make sure the technology and the pedagogy and the content was going to be something we could integrate. And that is probably the most difficult part of doing a one-to-one. -one. How do you integrate and deliver cur curriculum using the devices? And, how, and uh, most importantly, the first thing we wanted to do was train our teachers, uh, train them up as much as possible before the kids got the device. Because we knew as soon as we trained those teachers and they got the devices, as soon as the kids get them, they're off and running. The kids are going to really catch up quick, and, and they're going to take off. And so that's kind of what happens. But our teachers are constantly being trained, and there's training program, programs available that Michelle will talk about in a minute. One of the things that uh, we wanted to also ensure was that our parents were involved and engaged in the process because the parents would be the ones that they're going to vote for this general obligation bond to actually tax themselves to give those, their kids a $600 device that some says, you know, has a lifespan of 18 months or two years. And I'll talk about how we were able to convince them that that is not the case, but nevertheless, it was very important to provide these devices for their students, to, to provide the technology. And the parents understood that because it truly was going to give the students an open window to the world of teaching and learning and growing in the 21st century. So our parents were very important in that. Uh, one of the ways that we got the word out, we, we had an event called Transformation Day, and we had Apple uh, distinguished educators come in to demonstrate the use of these devices and what they could do in the classroom setting. We had uh, middle school students come in. We had high school students come in for, for uh, assemblies to, to discuss how to use these devices and they demonstrated them and then at night we had a uh, an adult uh, more adult theme presentation and we brought in our elected officials business owners uh, some of our uh, post-secondary uh, education administrators and teachers and professors and we went through the process of why this is important 
and uh, it helped to galvanize, galvanize even more support for the bond, which was titled Measure X. Now, when, they call, when you call the county office and ask, what's the title of my bond? You think it's gonna be like A, you're gonna get letter A. But no, they gave us X. So we thought real quick, said, how do we turn it around? And we said, X is for excellent education. And so everybody bought it. <laughs> but it was uh, you know, one of those things where everything we were doing was trying to brand this effort so it would be a positive for us. And, and parents and students and community members will see that this was important. Um, let me go back. As you can see in the uh, photo, we have our state superintendent, Tom Torlickson there, our assembly member there, principals and other supporters. This is the, uh, one of the head um, uh, officers in CTA, because we wanted our teachers unions involved in this as well. And everyone pulled together to support Measure X. And on the day of the voting, this is uh, in the 2012 election, uh, the initiative passed with 67% of the vote. And we thought that was just a fantastic uh, showing and the support from the community. Everyone was rallying behind the need to transform our school district to truly prepare students for college, career, and citizenship. Now, fin financing will be one of the main uh, obstacles to, for some moving forward, but there are, you know, if you don't want to go general obligation bond, there's other options, private funding, uh, there's, you know, common core funding, which provides a small amount of money, not really enough, but you can start scaling up using some of those funds. Uh, you can, if your general fund is healthy, maybe some of that. Textbook funding and then uh, some private foundations will often uh, tend to have grants and programs that can help uh, school districts. But our school district is now 20,000 students. There was no way we were gonna get that kind of money and we had to transform. Now, we cannot wait, you know, do eighth grade this year, ninth grade that year. We did preschool through high school, same year, and everyone had an iPad. We're gonna transfer uh, over now to our next major um, challenge, I would say, but opportunity, and that comes in the way of infrastructure. When you began the, uh, the rebuilding or building of your infrastructure, uh, it's probably the most important, you know, once you're gonna go in this path, and I hope everyone is already on that path, you gotta make sure infrastructure is in place, and there's a lot of technical language and jargon. I turned over to Israel for that, and he'll go over infrastructure. So thank you so much for your time. Israel Oliveris. So like Dr. Adams said, he came to us. He told us we're going to go ahead and move forward with this one-to-one -one initiative. So when we started our uh, pilot of 5,600 devices, we quickly noticed that our network wasn't ready to be able to support uh, 20,000 uh, iPad environment. So what we did is we started uh, doing a survey right away of our network, see where we were and what we needed to do not only to be able to support that amount of devices, but also be able to design a network with scalability and growth in mind to be able to sustain any other additional devices that we, we might introduce in the future. So we, we took a look at our bandwidth. We realized that we needed to place an access point in every room uh, throughout each campus through our district. So that would allow us to support 30 plus devices per classroom plus teacher devices. So we estimated a ratio of about three to one, uh, depending on, on the number of uh, students. Uh, another challenge was the bandwidth. We do rely on our county office of ed for, for the connection out to the internet. So at the time, we were sharing a one gigabit uh, pipe out to the internet with three other districts. So that affected the performance and the end user experience drastically. We started looking at other solutions that we might be able to introduce to bring some of that consumption down. So we thought about local caching servers. So we placed a caching server at every school site that would allow us to cache some of those applications from Apple. So instead of going out to the internet every time, you have to download the app once, it'll cache locally, and then users don't have to go out to the internet, they'll pull locally from your, from your network. We also took a look at some of the device services. I mean, we all know how Apple TVs work, but on the back end, it's a bit more complicated. Uh, there's services such as Bonjour that require config special configuration throughout your network so they can communicate and see each other. So that's another thing that we looked at and uh, started addressing right away. Our content filters, since our students did take devices home for secondary students, we started looking at how can we secure devices not only in campus, but outside our network. 
So what we started doing is we started filtering devices from home using what's called the global proxy. So we redirect all the traffic from home back to us and back out to the device. So the device is compliant 24 seven. It doesn't matter where the student goes. It could be Starbucks, McDonald's, home. They'll always be compliant and communicating back to us and always filtered. So when we started looking at how to manage these devices, we started with, uh, with Apple Configurator as most people do, but we started noticing that that was not scalable. There was no way that we were gonna roll out 20,000 iPads using Apple Configurator. So we started uh, looking at different solutions and we found that we needed a mobile device management solution. We started evaluating some and we re quickly realized that AirWatch was the best suited for us. Allow us to not only replicate our Active Directory structure from within the console and, and how MDM is structured, but go down as granular as hosting devices at a great level. So they're not just all in one general group. You could, you could assign profiles based off of grade level, teachers, whatever you want to do. So that allowed us to secure the, the devices over the air without the need to touch each single device. We could provision any email configurations, Wi-Fi configurations, uh, and that's all done wirelessly. It all also allowed us to integrate with Active Directory and our student information system. Those are customizations that we did so we could have a seamless workflow. So each student in our district does have their own Active Directory account and their own email account provided by us. So they use that information to enroll in AirWatch and get the configuration and applications that they need. Also with AirWatch, we use Apple's managed licensing program. In the beginning when we started looking at purchasing apps and distribution, we realized that it was gonna be something very costly to maintain throughout the years. So Apple released Apple's, um, the managed licensing program. So what that allowed us to do is lend out a license for a student that needed it and pull it back as soon as they were done. So it allowed us to repurpose some of the licensing and it'd be more of a one-time cost than, uh, than cost throughout the year. And most importantly, Apple's device enrollment program. Uh, what that does is that it uses Apple's servers to automatically associate to your MDM solution. And that's actually been paying off a lot lately. Uh, we've had a few devices that went missing throughout the years, and they're coming back to us now because of Apple's device enrollment program. So what it does is it just puts it in this one endless cycle that it doesn't matter how many times they erase the iPad, they'll always receive configuration from us. So we can lock down the device, we can prevent use, and within the configuration, there's our contact information. So we start receiving calls throughout the whole US uh, you know, please unlock my iPad. So then we would start looking at it and realize that iPad was stolen X amount of time. So we would, you know, put them in contact with security in our district and get the iPad back. So that's allowing us to protect our investment and, and get some of those iPads back that were, that were sold. In order to support the initiative, we started with about four technicians, which was a task on its own. Uh, we had to support the rollout and support for teachers, students, admin with regular IT work. So we went ahead and expanded on that. We hired two more technicians, which brought our account up to six, and we also uh, created a new position for IT assistants, which is tier one work. They handle some of that iPad enrollment, uh, basic troubleshooting, uh, to be able to support those students, and also man that helped us. So we created a live help desk, which our staff could call at any time, and also our students. And they'll be able to help them remotely if it's something that could be fixed over the phone or using our MDM. We also use Apple's uh, GSX program, which is basically over-the-air diagnostics for any devices that might have issues. So using all this uh, allowed us to support the end user experience and also be able to maintain that, that level of support throughout, throughout our, our, our program. So now we'll, I'll turn it over to Michelle so she could talk about the educational side and the integration of technology in the classroom. And we are gonna stop talking at you at the end and give time for questions and answers so that you can think of those things that you wanna ask any of the three of us or our teachers that are here. So we started um, 
in 2012 and looking at administrative regulations and board policies, and we soon realized that those were out of date. They had things like pagers in them. So we had to rewrite those with our attorneys, and we went through the uh, procedures through the board, and we wrote an accepted new board policy. And with that, we rewrote our um, AUPs and our RUPs, and so all students and parents must sign those. Uh, I think Israel's already mentioned, but preschool through sixth grade keep them in carts and they stay on campus. We use a lock and charge cart for storage and a Griffin survivor case. We're often asked, how do we protect those devices? Those are the two things that help us protect those devices. And secondary students, seventh through twelfth grade, take them home. Digital citizenship, we have to do that to remain E-rate compliant. We use Common Sense Media. If you'd like to see any of our materials we've used from Common Sense Media, they are on our iTunes U courses, and those are free and open if you look up Coachella Unified School District. So for storage and logistics, we, I mentioned that we did use cases from the Griffin Survivor and the lock and charge cart. Uh, we check in and out those equipments using our librarians and our instructional media assistants. Uh, they check those equipments out through Destiny just like they would a textbook. So the students are, those are scanned to them and, and stored in there. Uh, we did work with our unions and uh, wrote some MOUs for instruction of, in the classroom. So with our teachers union, we have a two-year MOU that they will not be evaluated on the use of technology in the classroom. And that two-year MOU is, is ending, so evaluations with technology will be, start next year. We also worked with our um, classified union and rewrote our job description since our instructional and media assistants were now um, being asked to work with the iPads as well as textbooks in the libraries. So these are our strategic partners. We still rely on these partners. It's not a one-time purchase for us. So we rely on our strategic partners to uh, help us with changes and things that are coming up new in technology. And so, uh, as I've mentioned, I do have all their contacts for you. And we'll have some handouts at the end if you'd like them. But we use Lock and Charge for our carts, Griffin for our cases. We use CDWG as our reseller and AirWatch for our MDM. So when we started out, we had one coordinator in Ed Services for Educational Technology, and I was the Director of Elementary Education. And he, his name was Matt, and he reported to me. And uh, Dr. Adams said, hey, uh, other duties as assigned. We all know how that goes. Would you sit in on the Apple calls? I'm like, sure, I'll sit in on the Apple calls. And so uh, we soon realized that me and Matt weren't going to be good enough to help um, with this deployment. And so we uh, had the birth of what we call the I Center. We had a contest and the students made, named our building and we have our own um, logo and we opened an educational technology division. So my four uh, T3s we call them, for, for most of you that would be ATOSA. So teachers training teachers in technology and all four of them are here today. If you would just stand for a second. so. <laughs> we stole them out of the schools and the principals dreaded that call when I made it so uh, but um, and then we have a coordinator who uh, Dr. Adams introduced Mr. Semino and, a and, and Israel came from IT and so the I Center was born so then we just needed to know how are we going to support teachers in the classroom every day and, and move the needle from pockets of greatness to systemic change with iPads in the classroom. So some of the things we did was we started a doctor's office on Mondays and Wednesdays. Doctor's office is not fix my iPad or come fix my projector or my smart board. Doctor's office is come sit with one of the teachers and work on lesson plans for integrating technology and common core into your lesson plans with your iPad and your MacBook Pro or your MacBook Air. So that was a hard shift for our teachers because they kept bringing us things to fix and we kept saying we can't fix it either. So you still need to follow the process and contact IT. Um, Tech Tuesdays, uh, one of the changes we've made in doctor's office, we always have that at the district office. Our district covers 1,250 square miles. We're about 30 miles south of here, and we weren't getting quite as many people as we wanted into that district office. So um, we do now do Mondays out at school sites, and we also now record all of our sessions with GoToMeet. And so they can either watch it from Starbucks or they can see it, it's hosted, um, so they can view it any time at their convenience. So that, I think that's helping with us getting teachers to attend 
our sessions. We do the same thing with Tech Tuesdays. We survey our teachers at, in the spring, and it's about that time right now to survey them again on what topics they want for the following school year on Tech Tuesdays. We also listen. If they say, hey, we, we missed that one, we want you to do that again. Um, we do repeat them. We do get input from our administrators. Um, Dr. Adams gives us topics sometimes too that he'd like to see, so we um, take input and very open to that. The next thing we've done that's really starting to take off right now and become very successful, we've done it for about a year and a half, but right now it's really working for us, is we have opened up our track it system, which is how they book a technician to fix equipment, to book a T3. So they can put in there, I'm a fourth grade teacher at Las Palmitas Elementary School, and I'd love for you to come in at my lunchtime and talk to me about what, um, about going paperless or using a specific application, or using GarageBand. So um, we do that, we go to grade levels, we go to PLCs, we go before school, we go during their prep time. So they can book us, we have principals book us for staff meetings this way, they can also book us for um, uh, PLCs is a great one, so grade levels book us. So right now it's taking off, and I need more T3s, Dr. Adams. <laughs> so we're getting booked every day. So that's, that's a really great thing for us. So, and the nice thing about Track It is at the end of the completed assignment, we have less than a week turnaround for my T3s to get to them for the instruction that they need, by the way, for a time frame, is that it sends them a survey on how did we do. So I recently presented all of that data at a board meeting for both the technicians and the teachers so they could see exactly how were customer satisfaction rates and completion rates for all of our work orders. So that's been very successful for us. The next thing is um, that I mentioned briefly is that we do use iTunes U extensively to push out our curriculum. We currently have 15 courses on iTunes U, and it's all open and public, so you're welcome to go on there. If you look up Coachella Unified uh, School District, you can see all of our curriculum on there. There's things such as going paperless, the first five days in the classroom with iPads for both secondary and elementary, so there's lots of good information that these hard folks have, have created. And, and the newest thing that I've just already mentioned is the webinars for learning um, on demand. So we often get asked what apps do we recommend. We really try to structure um, apps around iWorks and iLife, but here's a little video we created with, there's an app for that. Need a way to communicate with your students? beyond the classroom and build a blended learning environment, there's an app for that, Edmodo. Edmodo allows you to post assignments, you can also post discussion prompts, and your students can respond to them outside of the classroom. Do you need an app to run a paperless classroom? There's an app for that, Shobi. Shobi allows you to create assignments and classes, and your students turn in right within the app. Need a way to create notes and annotate over text? There's an app for that. Note anytime. With note anytime, you can add in handwriting, you can even add in text. Have students use Note Anytime to create assignments and turn them in using Shobi. Need a way to record lessons? There's an app for that. Educrations. Educrations allows you to annotate, you can drop in pictures, and you record your lessons. Finally, need an app that allows you to share videos, images, and PDFs across devices and between your Mac? There's an app for that. InstaShare. With InstaShare, you can send images, PDFs, documents, and videos back and forth between iPads, and you can even share with your Mac. So the next thing we did to support teachers is Dr. Adams came to the ICE Center and he'd been trying to work with some colleges and say we need, to, we need to honor the work that teachers are doing in the classroom and how can we create a course for them um, to show that they've moved up the SAMR model which is the basis of all of our professional development. And so we created a Samurai course. Um, they very quickly, the teachers, I think, came up with the name right away. And so it stands for the SAMR model advanced instructor. So um, there's currently a trademark pending on that title. But um, if you'd like to know how to write your own SAMR course, we're having a breakout session tomorrow, I believe, at 3.30.
So um, it's a five-week course. The teachers can attend. They are not paid for their attendance. Um, it's voluntary basis. We've uh, recently moved those out to school sites and are getting greater attendance. We have about 50 graduates at this time. And we don't um, just pigeonhole that to teachers. We currently have classified staff, instructional media assistants, and some of my IT guys are recently in our course. So um, it's five weeks, they have to attend class. There's an assessment and a project due at the end. And at the very end of turning in their assessments and the teachers grading their projects, they get board recognition, they get a certificate, and they get an email tagline that says Samurai that they can use on all of their district emails. So they really like that part. Um, but, but that's a really great way to honor the work that teachers are doing in the classroom and we're hoping one day that colleges start looking at those kind of courses to support the work that we're doing. But we're going to run around the audience and open it up for questions and answers or if you feel like standing up and can you shout out or... Uh, yes, I was just wondering if you guys have a uh, tech refresh in mind for, for the end of life on the iPads? Yes, we do. So. Well, one of the things we are doing is training our techs to maintain the devices and the operating systems, and we transfer them down to preschool. As new iPads come out, we bring those uh, to the seniors. So uh, we have a re refresh plan based on the fact that our bond was $42 million. We only used half the, the first three years, and we're going to use the other half over the next six years because we've already out, uh, built the uh, infrastructure out to last at least 10 years. It can, hold, it can handle 60,000 devices. Although the county couldn't give us that much bandwidth, it can handle 60,000 devices and uh, in, in, our, in the initial purchase of the iPads. My question is how you handle end of the year procedures when you're collecting those iPads, especially for, you say second grade to six, right? It's the one that you're running one to one. So for elementary schools, we go ahead and, um, well, other devices stay in schools throughout the summer. Uh, there was a classroom at each school site that was rekeyed for storage purposes. So what we did is we distributed uh, Ziploc bags to kind of keep all the um, accessories together with a, a few labels outside the, the Ziploc bag. Has the student's uh, barcode, which is their, um, what they use to check out items to them via asset management. They have the asset uh, tag for the iPad. So they'll place everything in there. They'll check it in, and it was up to the librarians to organize that by grade level and alphabetically. So they went ahead and organized those devices, and when it came to re redistributing those devices, they were associated to that student already. Uh, the purpose for that is if a student takes care of their device, it's not fair for them to get a device that wasn't well taken care of previously, so it gives them that uh, accountability piece too. Yes, so verifying the, the state and the condition of the iPad is part of the check-in process. Uh, obviously, they're all in cases, but when they're damaged, I mean, it's pretty evident when there's something wrong with it. We do have an insurance uh, provider that, that we go through for repairs, so parents do have the option to buy supplemental insurance. That brings some of that cost down for, uh, for lost, stolen, and also any repairs. I know um, Marciela is handing out right now our handout, which goes over everything we've talked about. And some of this we didn't get to today, but talked about some of the things that you need to consider when going one-to-one -one or anything that you're doing for mobile uh, learning initiatives. And the, on the back side of that is all of our contact information, plus of the contact information for all of our strategic partners. So, but we still have a little bit more time for questions. I know you guys mentioned that you had to kind of buff up your bandwidth. Um, given that you guys implemented a global proxy, do you guys still have everything routing to district office for outbound, or do you guys have each school site kind of have its own internet connection? No, everything's, uh, so the way our network is designed, everything's point to point back to us and centrally, and then we reroute back out to the district office. Uh, district office just went, I mean, uh, County of Office of Ed just went through an upgrade also. So they're providing a overall 10 gigabit uh, pipe out to the internet, which is, we have to produce the amount of traffic that we're asking for before they give it to us. So right now we have a three gigabit pipe and we're pushing about 2.5 to 2.8 at a steady pace depending on time of day. Well, 
Thank you. A lot of great questions. I think you win prize for most questions asked. <laughs> awesome. Um, and thank goodness we have Israel here because I wouldn't, I don't know what the heck you guys are talking about at some point. <laughs> uh, but one final reason uh, we decided to move along this track was because of our parents who did not want their students to have to wear these shoes in the fields. And this was given to me by a parent because um, this is what she deals with every day to provide food for her family. And she asked us, please do something to change the future of our community and uh, walk in our shoes, understand why this is so important that you transform the school district. And we listened to them and we're gonna be out picking uh, some of the crops with them this year to show them that we have solidarity with them and we are transforming and we include them in this uh, movement forward. So we thank you all for coming today. And um, by the way, I am running for Q Board of Directors. If you uh, are a Q member, you can vote for me. And I would, you know, we all on the same path though to educate all American students to make sure they have connectivity in 21st century and the best education possible. So thank you, thank you for coming.